Okay, good morning again, everyone. My name is Jennifer Howard. I am the director of the Turner Senior Wellness Program. We are very happy to have Laura McCourt uh, presenting today on COPD. And I will turn the screen over to her. I will be here for any technical assistance during the presentation. If you have any questions um, about the technology, if you're struggling with anything or have any questions about this or other health related topics, you can certainly call us at Turner Senior Resource Center at 734-998-9353. And um, with that, Dr. McCourt, I am going to go ahead and turn the screen over to you. I will be here in the background, but I am going to turn off my mic and my camera. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, I'm uh, Laura McCourt. I am a um, geriatrics fellow with the University of Michigan. Um, Quick side note, hopefully my dog won't bark, but she <laughs> does occasionally. So don't mind the interruption if she does, please. Um, this is a fairly short presentation, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up um, and any other topics surrounding this that you may have questions about. This lecture is about COPD and you know, kind of the causes and um, you know, treatment and everything about, you know, kind of just the general overview. Um, and my, there we go, okay. So, you know, just, I like to start off with some statistics um, just to kind of really emphasize the importance of diagnosing and treating COPD. Um, it is, um, approximately 10% of people over the age of 40 have COPD. It's very, it's very common. Um, you probably know somebody who has it or have known somebody who has it. Um, prior to COVID-19, it was actually the third leading cause of death worldwide. Now this um, is mostly due to complications from COPD and like later stages of COPD. It's not that once you're diagnosed, it's a death sentence. It's usually after it's become chronic and, um, you know, people have been oftentimes managing it their whole lives or from about the age of 40. Um, the disease is basically, um, you know, there's mixed components of it. Some of it somewhat mimics asthma and some of it is more similar to like a chronic bronchitis, which would be kind of like an irritation and inflammation of the trachea and basically the airway is leading to the lungs. Um, both of those things tend to lead to airflow limitation. So basically difficulty getting air in and out of the lungs. Um, it's persistent, um, causes pretty much constant respiratory symptoms, but it is relatively speaking preventable and um, symptoms of it can be managed. So here you can see what I'm gonna emphasize as the most important risk factor for COPD. It doesn't look so cool when he's smoking, huh? Um, smoking is absolutely the biggest risk factor. And um, oftentimes they say, um, or what I've heard quoted is about 10 to 15 years of smoking, um, approximately one pack or greater per day, um, puts you at the highest risk. And obviously more than that um, will contribute to a higher risk. Um, now vaping has been something that has come up um, in the last few years, um, kind of been a little trendy among teenagers, which is sad, but um, that's something that sort of was promoted as almost like a safe smoking option. It is not safe. Um, the FDA has absolutely come out to say that this, this is also a risk factor for COPD and other lung related diseases and, um, to stay away from it. 
Um, secondhand smoking, such as um, exposure in childhood, when parents or relatives smoke, say in the car, or you, you know, maybe were around people that smoke, um, is also a risk factor. Now, this you know, is a little bit more nebulous because the person themselves wasn't smoking. So there's no real um, quantifiable amount to be um, exposed that's going to, you know, put you at most risk, but obviously just having been exposed for any long period of time um, over years and years definitely puts you at risk. Um, now, the exposures to fumes and dusts is a little bit more complicated because oftentimes people, you know, will come in um, saying, oh, well, you know, I've been, I've worked at a factory, such as a textile mill or a factory making batteries, um, working in, um, you know, welding um, in old buildings with asbestos. Um, kind of those types of careers sort of chronically um, cause you if you don't wear the proper masks and things like that to have um, chronic exposure to dust and basically just irritants to the lungs. Similar to smoking, dust is also an irritant to the lungs. So anything that irritates the lungs is going to put you at risk for COPD. So the symptoms, um, they very much are shortness of breath with activity. Um, that is, I would say when, when I've had a patient in the clinic, most of the time, um, my reason for referring them for testing or further investigation would be just them saying, hey, you know, I you know, have had issues walking up the stairs, getting really winded, I have to sit down. Um, you know, when they were really able to walk, you know, multiple blocks in the past. Now, this is something that would come on over a longer amount of time. So it's not something that, you know, you wake up and the next day you feel like you can't do that. This would be something where, you know, you're noticing that over time you're exercise reserve is not what it used to be um, that could warrant further testing. Um, wheezing, because again, like I said um, a few minutes ago, the um, one component of COPD is very much an asthma-like um, syndrome in that you, um, people oftentimes have wheezing and sometimes that is the first symptom we notice as well. Um, Chronic cough is definitely a component of COPD, but I'm sure maybe you've noticed um, people that have smoked or smoked for years tend to have a chronic cough. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean they have COPD, but again, if they've been smoking, they're definitely at a high risk. So um, oftentimes people will cough up mucus. Sometimes it'll be clear or yellow. Um, but it's almost a kind of chronic um, irritation of the lungs that causes this. Um, sometimes people can have chest tightness as well. Um, you know, there's, there's people who have come to the emergency department that have, you know, they think, uh, you know, my, my chest is hurting. Um, COPD is definitely, um, once any heart issues have been ruled out, um, COPD is definitely something to look into if chest tightness is kind of an ongoing continuous symptom for people. So I've seen that as well. Um, this is a loaded slide. I'll give you that. Um, but this is a questionnaire that I like to keep kind of in my back pocket for um, just, you know, trying to see if patients have risk factors for COPD. So it's a, it's a short questionnaire, but it kind of goes over all of those risk factors that I had mentioned. So for example, lived or worked in pollu polluted or smoke, um, smoky areas with dust, secondhand smoke, personal use of cigarettes, um, breathing changes with seasons or weather. So 
that's something that um, oftentimes people with COPD will come in over the winter or in the fall or spring when allergens start to come out and um, you know, some of their allergies can lead to um, an irritation of their COPD. The cold weather can also irritate COPD. I'm, you know, not sure if you've ever gone out in the cold um, for the first time in the winter and you kind of, you know, you take a deep breath and your, your chest is just kind of uncomfortable. Well, that's definitely, um, that's definitely something that um, if you already have COPD can definitely, um, that can make it worse. Um, and breathing um, difficulties with exercise, as I had mentioned. So basically, you know, like I said, it's gonna be people who have, um, you know, typically been able to do things like shovel snow, walk two or three blocks without getting short of breath, walk up a few flights of stairs without getting short of breath, and then slowly over time um, have been more limited. Um, and um, this, the fourth question kind of ties that in as well. So compared to other people your age, are you tiring out more easily? Um, and Oftentimes um, with COPD, people can have, as I've kind of hinted at, sort of exacerbations is what medically we call it, but um, kind of just an acute worsening of symptoms. Um, these can be um, in the form of things that look like colds, bronchitis, and pneumonia. So these are all things that affect the lungs and the upper airways. Um, so therefore can be um, a cause and or a result of um, COPD exacerbations or acute worsening. So for people that think they might have COPD, the um, most important test that we recommend is an in-office pulmonary function test. So this involves honestly quite a lot. It is a, um, you know, it's not an, it's not a procedure where they have to like give you a needle or anything like that, but you are very much expected to breathe into a tube, um, and like empty your lungs and take multiple really deep breaths, which can be difficult for people. Um, and um, they also will oftentimes give a, um, what's called a bronchodilator. So if they notice that um, you're having issues with um, um, kind of COPD related lung, sort of things, they'll, they'll um, give a medication to see if it makes it better. So basically a medication that would actually be the treatment for COPD and that would sort of um, reinforce the, our, the diagnosis. Um, I put blood work and imaging on this slide just to be inclusive, but there are no there really is no blood work or imaging that is going to completely confirm the diagnosis. The most important test is absolutely the pulmonary function test. Um, just a short story, when I was in residency, um, our pulmonologist had the residents all do a pulmonary function test. And I mean, I'm in good health, I'm young, and it was, it was still a lot. So it's definitely not an easy test for everybody. So this is kind of going over the medication treatments. So um, there's a little bit of lingo here. So um, that's just purely the names of the medication. So the mainstay of treatment for COPD is inhalers. And these are going to be oftentimes daily inhalers. So 
once or twice a day. The medications are um, sometimes short acting, oftentimes long acting medications that are going to kind of stay in the pulmonary, um, in like the airways to open them up during the day. That, you know, this is all terminology, but the big focus um, for this for this slide is that the main goal is to open up the airways. Some of the medications also kind of work to decrease the secretions um, that sort of come with um, the chronic bronchitis aspect of COPD. Um, but again, the main ones are definitely trying to open up the lungs or dilate them. Um, steroids play a role in COPD. Um, they oftentimes make people feel a lot better when they have COPD, but they are absolutely not for daily use in COPD. They will eventually make the situation worse and they have a lot of bad side effects that is irrelevant to this presentation, but should be limited. Um, Basically, their use primarily falls into what I was talking about earlier with the more acute um, issues with COPD. So when somebody is having a change in their symptoms that um, is worse than their normal symptoms um, and or they have the cold, pneumonia, that kind of a thing that I was talking about, um, they would get an antibiotic and a steroid and also just bump up their um, already existing inhaler therapy um, to get them over that um, time period of acute illness. And then they would go back to basically their baseline inhalers and that should be just fine for them. Um, so some other treatments that are what I really like to um, tell my COPD patients about are primarily avoiding risk factors. Going back to the previous slides, the primary cause of COPD is smoking. A hundred percent, one hundred percent recommend discontinuing any smoking, any tobacco use in COPD. That is, continues over the years to be um, the most effective strategy to prevent worsening of symptoms. Um, because it is a progressive disease, it will continue to get worse if people do, do continue to smoke. So definitely continuing to avoid those risk factors. Um, wearing PPE or protective equipment like masks and things like that when you are, if you have a job that involves those dusts and asbestos and, you know, factory working and things like that. Um, you know, I definitely have patients that come in and say that they don't use, it. it's uncomfortable and I get it, but it's worth it. It's worth it to not develop COPD. Um, getting a yearly flu vaccine is very important for people with COPD, and I like to really make sure that my patients are vaccinated when they have COPD, especially because, and now COVID is going to be added to that list. Um, but definitely a yearly flu shot and a, and the one-time pneumonia vaccine is very important because these are viruses that affect the lungs. So, um, and bacteria, viruses and bacteria that affect the lungs. So getting vaccinated for these um, infections will absolutely decrease your risk of getting them and will also, um, you know, and if you're decreasing the risk of getting them, you're decreasing the amount of times that you'll need those steroids and have an acute attack. Um, regular exercise is good for everybody. Um, you know, it's, um, you'll see this in almost every, um, with every condition everywhere all the time, but 
regular exercise gets the lungs working, gets the blood flowing, gets, you know, um, really is, is just good for, for it strengthens your muscles. Um, it helps to, I think it's protective, honestly, um, against a lot of, a lot of, um, chronic illnesses. Um, then there is a formal exercise program, um, through mostly I've seen pulmonologists send people to this. It's pulmonary rehabilitation. It's basically, um, its goal is aimed at strengthening the muscles that help the lungs function, um, is really how, how it's been explained. Um, and I've seen patients have um, wonderful results from this. It is a formalized and supervised exercise program. So you're doing things directed towards specifically helping with your COPD. Um, now you might've heard of some other similar programs such as cardi cardiac rehabilitation. So after somebody were to have a heart attack or something like that, that's more focused on the heart. This is very much the respiratory muscles and strengthening those so that they can be as successful as possible in dealing with this chronic illness. Um, that is oh, almost all. Um, so I like to um, just kind of go over um, the fact that proper treatment of COPD in those who have it will improve symptoms, it reduces the amount of times they're hospitalized, which is actually something, you know, doctors use to determine the severity of the COPD itself. So the less time your times you're hospitalized, overall, the less severe your COPD is. That is if you're being hospitalized for COPD. Um, Treat, properly treating COPD will definitely improve your exercise capacity. So both exercise and treating COPD will definitely help you be more active and be more able to deal with the symptoms themselves. Um, and overall prolongs survival, which is absolutely the goal. Um, while this is a chronic disease um, and people, you know, there's no cure, there's no getting rid of it, you can deal with the symptoms. And these are, you know, the things I discussed are basically ways of managing the symptoms and hopefully not having it get worse. And like I said, short presentation, I'm very happy to take any questions anybody has. Okay, as a reminder, if you have any questions, you can put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we may have the ability, yeah, I think that we have, um, we don't have too many people to make this out of control. If you wanted to raise your hand, I can also um, open up your microphone if you wanted to ask a question live. So you can just raise your hand and then I will see that and I will open up your microphone. I do not have questions at this time, but I always wait a couple moments because when I do, I usually get a flood of questions. And then um, as soon as I think I'm done, then I get more. <laughs> so yeah, that's okay. Take your time. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. McCord, I, I will start, I will have a question. Um, I often, it seems like when people do have COPD, I, I always hear people describing that they also have heart issues um, many times, um, congestive heart failure, other things. Is there a link between the two? If they're like, if you have COPD, can that long-term cause heart issues, heart damage, that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Um, and we, we see this a lot, honestly. Um, so the heart and the lungs are very much intimately related. So, um, you know, the, the lungs bring in the oxygen and, you know, pump and the, the, 
the oxygen goes through the vessels to the heart and then that oxygenated blood goes throughout the body. So when people have things like COPD, um, not only the airways, but also the vasculature or the vessels in the lungs tend to have more stress on them. Over time, this stress tends to affect the right side of the heart. So oftentimes, and this is a very broad generalization, but just a way to kind of manage this um, picture in your head, oftentimes when people have things like heart attacks or um, things that damage the heart in that way, um, it's often the left side of the heart that, that um, suffers. Mm -hmm. um, lung disease is primarily what causes issues on the right side of the heart. Again, it's a broad generalization and there's very much overlap and other things that, um, you know, play into that. But um, that's a really good way of thinking about it because the right side of the heart is a little bit more sensitive. Um, it's thinner, um, it's um, harder to treat if there are any issues with it. So definitely another good thing, and I should have put it on the list, a reason to treat and, and um, CO, treat COPD and get ahead of it and um, quit smoking if that is an issue. So I, I do have a follow-up question because I know that there are links between high blood pressure, um, diabetes that's not controlled, obesity, many other chronic conditions with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia. Has there been a, have there been any studies that link COPD to an increased risk of dementia? None that I have seen. Um, that does not mean it does not play a role. Um, you know, one thing I like to think of with dementia, um, and lately it's been brought up, is that things that cause social isolation, such as hearing loss, vision loss, things like that can be, um, can actually predispose people to dementia. I would say COPD would play in almost more in that way. Um, in that, you know, if you're just not feeling good, you don't feel like you can exert yourself, you don't feel like you can keep up with people, or you're always sick, um, you know, you're always getting these infections, um, sometimes you just don't feel good. And that can lead to just generalized over time, you know, not exercising as much, not maybe taking care of yourself as well. And um, sometimes I think it almost would make, you know, just from conceptually, I can see it leading to dementia in those ways, um, but I have not personally seen any studies linking it. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. And um, I am not seeing any, I don't see any hands up and I don't see any further questions in the Q&A. Nisha, um, are there any questions in the room? Just checking back to make sure. No questions at all in here. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, Dr. McCourt, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned before, Dr. McCourt said that we would be able to share slides with you. So if you're registered for this presentation, which if you're here, you probably are, um, you will get an email with uh, a link to the slides. And we will also have the recording of this presentation on our Turner Senior Wellness Program YouTube playlist, along with another uh, a number of other healthy living lectures. And Dr. McCourt, did you have any final things that you wanted to wrap up with before we conclude? Great. Um, no, I think um, I, I hope the fact that we have no questions means that it was a pretty comprehensive <laughs> presentation. So, but if there's anything that comes up and questions that people have, feel free to email me and I'll, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to call us at the Turner Senior Resource Center at 734-998-9353. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your morning.